that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath, swept on a faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are, and you are, sorry, you are our potter, and all we are the work of your hand. Have thine own way. pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, the giver of every good and perfect gift, and Jesus, that you gave for us, we thank you. We don't really know how to appreciate what he has done for us. 
but maybe one day we will when we go home to be with you. The graciousness that you have for us, for appreciation for what little we do. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that you were kind enough, good enough, perfect enough to let your son die for us. As we assemble this morning, help us to remember that, to keep it in our hearts, that we might not sin against thee. Temptation is everywhere around us. Trouble is everywhere around us. Salvation is in Jesus. We pray that you would be with our sick folks this morning. And it's a long list, Father. Be with them and help them and their families, that they will be able to come back to church and be with their families again. We would appreciate it so much, Father, if you would look after them and help them. Be with us this morning, Father, as we've assembled to do your will and to glorify you and to worship you and to praise Jesus, our Savior's name, for what he has done for us and for what he's still doing for us. Be with our missionaries. Help them, Father, to feel man's hearts overseas with your gladness and wonderfulness that they can become Christians too, that they can be one day in heaven with you. Be with our preacher this morning as he brings us the message and be with us as we gather around your table to commemorate our Savior's death and life. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. King of my life, I crown thee now, thy
Does everyone have the elements of the Lord's Supper? Great. I want to read to you a passage of Scripture. We, we don't read a lot from Mark. Matthew or Luke seems to be the, maybe the favorites. But in Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse number 22, let me read these few words. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and brake it and gave it to them and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup what he had given thanks, he gave it to them, they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will not drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new with you in the kingdom of God. There are several things that just literally stand out in this that we understand and of course the uh, elements of the Lord's Supper we talk about the bread which represents his body and the fruit of the vine which represents his blood and how fitting that is <clears throat> when we use this word represent what we mean by that is it typifies it stands in contrast if you take this piece of bread and you compare it to the physical body Jesus is saying, take, eat. Now, if he meant this in a literal way, they would have literally taken a bite out of the side or the leg or the arm of our Lord and Savior. He didn't tell them to do that. That's not what they were, what they were to do. He said, take, eat, this is. Now, the idea of the word is here within its context means that it represents, it stands in the place of. So when we partake of the bread, we're, ta we're taking that which represents or stands in the place of his physical body. And when we drink the fruit of the vine, uh, it represents the blood that coursed his veins that was shed on the cross of Calvary, which by the way, that same blood purchased the church. And so through these two elements, the body and the blood, it helps us to remember our Savior, what our Savior did for us, and how that he paid the supreme sacrifice, and all of this for the remission of our sins. Is it any wonder that he wants us to remember him Let's give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank thee so much for Christ and for what he means to us. And through the elements that as we worship thee through this Lord's Supper, that we can give thanks to thee for the body which thou hast shed for us, represented in this unleavened bread. 
Bless us as we partake. Forgive us, and may we ever retain this image in our mind. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's give thanks for the cup. Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks for this supreme sacrifice that thou hast made on the cross for us. We ask thee to bless this cup as it represents the blood of Christ, that life-giving uh, blood which did and accomplish so many things. Most of all, we thank thee that for it we can come in contact with thee and that we can have the forgiveness of our sins bless this cup now as we partake representing the blood of christ forgive us in christ's name amen That completes the Lord's Supper, but we're also given the opportunity to lay by and store and give of our means as God has, has prospered us. We understand that the very wor work and nature of the church is a spiritual kingdom, but it, it's built here on the physical earth. And so through our means, through our work, and through our our planning, our retirement years, we, we lay by in store and we give back to God. God has greatly prospered us. And so what I want to just mention briefly is how is our gift as we give uh, through the contribution, how does it compare to what Christ through God has done for us? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much for every blessing of life and especially for the ability that we have had to work for Thee, those that are continuing working, those who shall be working for Thee. That through all of these means that we can su supply the money that will sufficiently support our families, not only our physical family, but support the church as well. Help us to constantly evaluate our gift, making sure that we're giving that which thou hast truly blessed us with. Forgive us, we pray in the name of Christ, and amen. And out here on the, uh, uh, to my right, there are collection plates, and if you will drop your contribution in there, it will be greatly appreciated. And let me just say one more thing. In regards to the contribution, this congregation is to be thanked. You have said that you would support our new works and that we would meet our budget. And as of date, if I'm correct on this, Doug, we have met that. Thank you so much for what you're doing. First John chapter 4 and verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. If you're able, I should you please stand. <clears throat> Were you there?
Good morning. It is good to see you all. Got a good number here, and we're thankful for that. I want to ask you to be praying for me and my family this week. I know that you already do, but um, yesterday was the yesterday would have been my mother's seventieth birthday, um, and she passed away in 1999. We buried her on my birthday. And so every year on those anniversaries, it's emotional for me and, and my family especially. On top of that, Rachel's birthday is coming up this week. It's Thursday, and, and we're at the same age that my mother was when she passed. And maybe that's weighing a little heavier on me than I first realized. But Rachel's grandmother also is nearing the end of her life. And uh, we're just waiting to hear any moment, any day that she has passed on to her reward. And Rachel's grandfather passed away on her birthday. So it is a, it's an emotional week. She'll be down here and we'll be heading to Jacksonville as soon as we get word about her grandmother this week. So we just ask that you would remember us in your prayers. Some of the greatest moments in our lives and in our nation's history are what we might call shared experiences. They're things that we go through together, things that we 
collectively feel and experience. When we think back to our nation's founding, the events around July 4th, 1776, it was a movement. It was, uh, it was an experience shared by those who were present and the ideals and the, and the motivations of the men who, who led that great revolution are honorable. And they are things that have shaped our future now for coming up on 250 years. We think about December 7th, 1941. A date that will live in infamy is what our president said. The date that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. It was a day that many of us, I don't know that any of us, would remember personally some of us may have been alive on that day, but I don't know that any of us would remember where we were and what the emotions were, but we can certainly imagine. We've seen and we've heard from people who were there, and it was something that was shared by our nation. November of 1963 in Dallas when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Now many of you can remember that and know exactly where you were and what emotion shook our nation and, and the, the disbelief that something like that could happen to us within our own borders. The moon landing in 1969, an event that will change history from here on out, and many of you can remember where you were for that great event. I remember when the space shuttle exploded, the Challenger, in 1986. I was in, I believe I was in second grade, and we had all gathered together, all the students to watch and to see, and, and it was just unbelievable what happened right before our very eyes. And then, of course, 9-11, September 11, 2001. I was working at the Regions Bank in Orange Beach. We lived in Foley, and I was driving that way, listening to the John Boy and Billy show. And, and they announced something had happened, and I didn't understand how serious it was until I got to work, and, and you remember... The country just shut down. Working at a bank, you expect a certain number of customers. There was no one that came to the bank that day or the next. And you remember the, the outpouring of emotion, the reaction. Those are shared experiences. And even if we weren't there personally for some of them, we, we've heard stories and we can imagine what it would be like, what it must have been like, the emotion that, that was felt. The lessons that were learned and the way that those events shaped and changed us as a people and as individuals. And this lesson really has its motivation in something that Brother Steve Jernigan sometimes says when he's directing our minds at the Lord's table. He reminds us that we were there in a sense when Jesus was crucified, when he gave himself that we were all represented by the people who were there. And in our mind's eyes, we can go back to the cross of Calvary, to Jesus hanging there. But it's not just that moment. There are other moments that I want us to think about, other shared experiences that we read about in Scripture from which we can gain lessons. We can put ourselves in that place, in their shoes. We can imagine what it must have been like to be there personally because of what we read in Scripture and we can let that shape us, change us, and we can learn lessons from placing ourselves in those places. The first one I want us to consider is when God's people were in Egypt, when the Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians doing their bidding we can say that God arranged for His people to go to Egypt 
In Exodus chapter 15, that's what God tells Abraham. Genesis 15 verse 13 says, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. God arranged for his people to be in Egypt. He knew that was what needed to happen for his plan to unfold. He told Abraham that was what was going to happen. And he did this for one reason. According to Exodus 12, verse 12, he took his people, he allowed and arranged for the Israelites to become slaves in Egypt so that he could execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. So that he could show that he was and is the one true power in all the world. Exodus 12 verse 12 says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. God arranged for his people to be in this situation because he had a plan for them. He was going to bring them out. They were a people with no power who were helpless. They didn't have a defense, a military that they could fight and rebel against Egypt and break away from them, remove themselves from their shackles. No, it was only by the power of God that they were able to walk out of their bondage loaded down with the blessings that God intended for them, the riches of Egypt, they spoiled Egypt in that sense as they were departing. And he did all this to demonstrate his power. He did all of this so that the world would know that he alone is God. And they got that message. The other nations then, as, as, Israel, as the Israelites are making their way back to the promised land, the other nations have heard, they know what God has done for the, for the Israelites in bringing them out of Egypt, their exodus. They know that there is only one true God. They may not serve Him, but they have seen His power. So He arranged that His people, these shepherds, these meek and powerless people, would be in a position from which they needed deliverance. And both the Israelites and the Egyptians saw God's power in the plagues. In the plagues, God first of all turned water into wine, the river into wine, into blood. God turned the Nile into blood. Then followed the frogs, the lice, the flies, the murrain, the, the disease on the cattle the boils on their flesh, and then hail. Hail like the world had never seen. Hail that destroyed all their crops. Followed by the locust. The locust that completely ravaged the countryside of Egypt. Ate everything that was consumable. Followed in the ninth place by the darkness. The darkness that was, it was, you could feel it. The darkness that separated Egypt from the Israelites. And then the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. All of these God did. The Israelites saw them. The Egyptians saw them. And they demonstrated God's power. Imagine being there. Imagine being there as Moses stood before Pharaoh. It would be, it would be one of those moments that you never Forget. And I know we've seen it depicted really in the Ten Commandments movie, but imagine being there. You see Moses standing before Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh's heart is hardened. It's a moment that you would never forget. And because of that, God demonstrated his power. Imagine being there when that hail was falling on Egypt, but not on the Israelites, not in Goshen, but in the rest of Egypt. The hail falling, hail like the world had never seen, hail that set everything on fire, great giant hailstones. Imagine seeing that and knowing it didn't have to be this way. This could have been prevented, this could have been stopped if Pharaoh had softened his heart, if he had let God's people go. It didn't have to come to this, but here we are. Imagine seeing that with your own eyes. 
Imagine being one of the Jews who was in the daylight, in the light, and being able to put forth your hand into darkness and not able to see your own hand and to realize only the power of God can do this. Imagine being one of those Israelites who had put the blood on your doorposts and who had gotten everyone into your home and had partaken of that Passover lamb with their, with their staves in their hands and their loins girded up. They were ready to go that night because of what God was going to do. Imagine hearing the wails of all the Egyptians. There was not a house in Egypt where one was not dead. The Bible tells us, imagine being there. Imagine being there as they left and they come to the Red Sea and there's no way out. They're stuck between a rock and a hard place. But God parts the Red Sea and they walk across on dry ground. Imagine seeing then the waters come back together and cover up and drown Pharaoh and his army. Imagine seeing these things with your own eyes. Imagine then going to Sinai, to this great mountain where God sets the mountain, as it were, on fire and hearing the great rumblings and knowing that Moses is there speaking with God face to face, as it were. Imagine being there. If you were there, if you could see it with your own eyes, you would know, you would understand The power that God alone has. But that's just it. Through their shared experience, through what we read in Scripture, we can know God's power just as surely as if we had been there ourselves. As if we had seen it with our own eyes, experienced it in our own bodies. Were you there in Egypt to know, to see, To witness the power of God. When you look at the world around you. You look at creation. The way God has ordered and arranged everything. The only logical conclusion you can reach is that there must be a God. A God who is all powerful. A God who alone can do these things. And that's what the Israelites understood. Now that... Witnessing those plagues, witnessing those miracles wasn't enough for them. It wasn't enough to keep them faithful. They still became untrue to God. They still lost their faith. They still denied Him in their practices. But imagine being there and imagine knowing firsthand. It would be something they would never forget. And God gave them memorials that they were to observe to remember what He had done for them in bringing them out of Egypt demonstrating His power, the power that He alone has. Put yourself in their place. You can know the omnipotence of God just as surely as they did. Were you there at the temple to behold the majesty of God? God dwelled with His people. He chose to dwell Among the Israelites, as they were coming out of Egypt, His presence was with them in the tabernacle. Wherever they went, there was a way for them to know that God was among them. That God was dwelling with them. The the gods of no other nations did this. They had their symbols, their emblems. I remember the, the story of Dagon, when the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines, it would fall down before the Ark of the Covenant. They had their images and their idols, but they didn't have the presence of their God in the midst of them. God chose to dwell among His people to signify and to show them that He had chosen them for this special purpose and that He approved of them and what they were doing. Now over time, as they became unfaithful to Him, we find that His presence was removed from among them. But as they're traveling, and and especially as Solomon builds the temple, God's presence comes down and inhabits that place to show that these are my people. I am among them. I approve of them. I am leading them and guiding them. 
David, of course, wanted to be the one who would build God a temple. David was a man after God's own heart. He loved God, loved to worship and praise God. He understood the mind and the nature of God, maybe better than anyone else that we read about in Scripture. And he desired to build God a permanent place, a place that he could dwell, a place where his presence would abide that didn't move around. They had the tabernacle, it was at Shiloh, but it was temporary. God, David wanted to build something majestic for God, but he wasn't permitted to. God didn't allow David to be the one who would build the temple, but God allowed David to prepare the materials, to plan it, to, to get things ready. God didn't allow David to build the temple because David was a man of war. Because he had shed so much blood. According to God's plan, according to God's will, it would be David's son, Solomon, who would build the temple. Solomon was the wise king. Solomon was the king who brought peace to Israel. Solomon, in that way, represents Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the one who has built God's temple in the world today, his church. In 1 Kings chapters 6 through 8, and then again in 2 Chronicles chapters 3 and 4, we read about the construction of the temple. We'll read just a few verses from 1 Kings just to get an idea of how ornate, how beautiful, how majestic this structure was. It took years to build. There was no cost spared. First Kings, uh, let's see, chapter 7. We'll read. Let's begin in verse 15. He cast two pillars of brass of 18 cubits high apiece, and a line of 12 cubits did compass either of them about. And he made two chapters of molten brass to set upon the tops of the pillars. The height of the one chapter was five cubits, and the height of the other chapter was five cubits, and nets of checker work, and wreaths of chain work for the chapters which were upon the top of the pillars, seven for the one chapter and seven for the other chapter. And he made the pillars and two rows round about upon the one network to cover the chapters that were upon the top with pomegranates. And so did he for the other chapter. And we'll stop there, but the description continues of how ornate and how specific everything was in the temple. And on top of all of that, it was all overlaid with gold. Everything that was inside the temple was overlaid with gold. Why do we find such specific descriptions of the construction of? The temple itself and the things that were in the temple. Why do we need to know about the pomegranates and the bells and the chapters and the, all of these things? We can imagine them with our, with our minds, but what do they mean to us? They go to further demonstrate the majesty of God. Every detail is important to God. That's what we need to understand. When we read the description of when we imagine what it would have been like to see this building being built, constructed, to behold the glory and the beauty of this temple, we're reminded that every small detail is important to God. I suggest to you that if this temple had not been built according to God's specifications, it wouldn't have stood. Just as if when Noah was building the ark, if he hadn't done exactly as God had commanded him, it wouldn't have floated. These particular specifications, these details that went into the building of the temple remind us that God is a God of perfection. That God knows every small detail of our lives, of everyone's lives, of everything that's going on in the world. That's part of his majesty. 
That's what we mean by His majesty. We're talking about His, his perfection. God's ability to know every tiny, small detail in our lives and to care about them. When we say majesty, we mean God's goodness. The temple was made of gold. It was overlaid with gold. It was the most expensive because God only does what is good for us. He only wants what is best for us. And that's what we're reminded of when in our minds we go back to that time and we see and we behold the temple that Solomon built. His majesty also means that he has a plan. God is perfect. He is good. And he's always thinking of the future for us. He has a plan for us. This wasn't the end. This wasn't the fullness of the purpose that he had for Israel. He had not brought them out of Egypt to Jerusalem. He didn't ask them to build a temple. When the temple was built, it didn't mean we have reached our pinnacle. We're everything God wants us to be. This is the end. It meant there was something yet to come. When we, in our minds, behold the temple that Solomon built, we're reminded of the majesty of God, His perfection, His goodness, and His plan for all mankind. In 1 Kings chapter 8, after everything's been built, Solomon prays this great prayer to God. That's what chapter 8 is, where he says, God, we know that this temple cannot contain you. You don't dwell in temples made with hands. You don't dwell in the heavens. The heaven of heavens can't contain you. And God, we want to be your people. If, if we're true and faithful to you, bless us. If we turn aside from you, discipline us and bring us back. God, we want to do what's right. This is what Solomon prays on this occasion. But he does so after, in verses 10 and 11, God's presence comes down and inhabits the temple. 1 Kings 8, 10 and 11. It came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Imagine being there. Imagine being at that dedication where Solomon bows himself in front of all the people and prays in front of this beautiful building. And it wasn't, it wasn't to draw attention to themselves or to Solomon. It was to praise and to glorify God because God needed a place that could properly house His presence. That's what this temple represented on this occasion. Now, of course, they came to put too much trust in the presence of the temple, but on the moment that it was dedicated, put yourselves there and behold the majesty of God in the construction of the temple. Were you there then at Calvary to know the love of God? God had prepared the world to receive and ultimately to reject Jesus in the fullness of time. Galatians 4 verse 4. Israel at the time when Jesus was born, when he began his ministry, Israel was so spiritually removed from who God created them to be that they were almost unrecognizable to who they were at the dedication of the temple. They were divided. There was such a division between the religious leaders and the common people. There was covetousness throughout the nation. There was legalism among the religious leaders. But this was the time that Jesus needed to come. Rome was this empire of iron that was unconcerned about spiritual things, didn't really care about the Jews' Messiah. This was the world into which Jesus was born, and it was exactly what God prepared them to be. There hadn't been a prophet, a writing prophet in Israel in 400 years since Malachi. The people had never seen a miracle in that sense. They had never heard or, or, or received written word from God. They didn't know what to expect. They didn't have a figurehead to lead them. They hadn't in many generations likened to Moses or Elijah. And this was the world that God had prepared for Jesus to be born into. God's preparation of the world in that sense shows His love for the entire world. 
John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's preparation of the, of the world, the fullness of time, shows that He loved the whole world. Jesus on the cross, though, was not an image to remember. If you had been there, as many did, maybe you would have just walked on by and wagged your heads. You would have said, well, I guess that's over now. He's been crucified. No more trouble from Him. It wasn't an image that people thought was going to be a life changer for them, many of them. But we know otherwise, and His disciples knew otherwise. Imagine being there at Calvary, seeing Jesus bloody from head to toe with that thorn, that crown of thorns on his head, that sign above his head. Imagine seeing the two thieves on either side of him representing really two states of humanity. Imagine seeing again the darkness that descended upon the world as Jesus was on the cross. Imagine feeling the earthquakes. Imagine seeing his mother there at the foot of the cross and knowing the emotion. Imagine being there. What we see when we see Jesus in that way is the fullness and the perfection of love. We know that this means that God loved not just us, not just Israel, but God loves every human being. And move forward three days and imagine being there to see that empty tomb. To see that His clothes have been folded and they're still lying there. Imagine being together with His disciples as he appears among you and you see and you touch the scars in his body imagine being there put yourself in their place and imagine the love that they understood that God had for them we can know the power of God, just as if we had been there to see the plagues. We can know the majesty of God, just as if we had been there to see Solomon's temple. And we can know the love of God, just as surely as if we had been at the foot of His cross ourselves, by reading about it in His Word. We weren't at these places. We weren't living during these times. They were shared experiences of God's people in those moments. But we can have the same understanding, we can have the same knowledge, and we can have the same faith. We weren't there, but there is a shared experience that we will all have together. And that is, at the end of time, we will all stand before God in judgment. Every person who's ever lived, every soul that has ever drawn a breath in this life, in this world, will stand before God in judgment and give an account for the things that we have done. Are you ready for that day? Imagine being there. It may happen today. It may happen tomorrow. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we know we will all be there. This morning, if you're here and you're not ready for that day, you're not ready for that moment, understand the power of God. Believe in His power. See His majesty and know His love. And this morning, obey the gospel. Give your life to Jesus Christ, believing in Him, repent of your sins, and follow Him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Confess that faith and be baptized in water. Your sins are washed away. You become a new creature. You can begin that journey today. Imagine being there with all the saved, with all the faithful of all the ages to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You can have that future today. If you need to obey the gospel, we encourage you to do so. If you need prayers of forgiveness or for strength and encouragement, whatever your need, we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and sing.
We have a number of announcements. First, I'd like to read this card from Pam Long. She says, thank you to all who kept me in your thoughts and prayers. God is so good all the time. Thank you also to the ladies who brought food. It was all very good and appreciated. God bless you all, Pam Long. We appreciate uh, Pam. I understand that she's going through therapy and is doing very well. We have a number of folks on our uh, second prayer list. Yeah, if it was any longer, it would take up the whole back page. But uh, let's see if we can work through some of these. Remember Heather Horton Norton, uh, Margaret Moore. Margaret has come home from the hospital, and uh, but she's on some medication to take care of a problem. Helen Shepard uh, has blood clots that she's dealing with, and um, uh, so we we'll remember her. Raymond Boyd. This is a brother in Christ, and he lives in Fort Payne in Alabama. Uh, he has a reoccurring brain tumor. He had one, it went away, and it has reoccurred. They have four children, and um, we learned of this through Lisa, and so we'd like to remember Raymond Boyd in that regard. Madison Mark, this is a friend of the Siemens. Uh, let's remember uh, Madison. Uh, Glenn Sullivan. Uh, Pam Long, as we mentioned, Charles Birch. This is the son-in-law of Paulette Cooper, has an unknown uh, infection. So we want to remember him. Uh, Wells Allen, Gunnar Phillips. Understand Gunnar had um, uh, his surgery at a home and uh, recovering and doing well. We're grateful for that. And Jacobson, uh, she fell and she's having a difficult time uh, healing up from some of that, those uh, accidents. Isabel Hardesty, uh, when she flew out to Texas with her mom, her foot swelled, and they didn't know just exactly what that's from, but it, we think that it may have just been from the flight. Uh, but remember Isabel, if you will. Uh, Christy Chastain, Esther Gruby, uh, Gail Benzer. Gail is redoing uh, therapy, and she's doing much better. Uh, Jeremy is home and he's recovering from his um, uh, kidney removal and uh, uh, Jeremy's wife Lisa uh, she's going to have an MRI tomorrow and so I know they would appreciate if you remembered uh, them the Cornelson's family of course are here today and we appreciate them let's remember uh, Claire I believe it is they're going to treat her with medication uh, for now, and they we're trusting that that will work. Uh, Jill and Jamie Llewellyn, these um, friends of Marcy Brown's, let's remember. Uh, Joanne Dapp, uh, she's home come, recovering from surgery. Uh, Bill Mears, Bill and Susie are here this morning, and we're so glad to see them. Uh, Rose Carlisle, Charles Massey, Charles and Brenda are here. We're grateful and uh, Cecil Ledbetter. These are all the sick that I have. And uh, one other thing that I need to mention, and that is on Saturday, November the 11th, this is for all of you ladies, there will be a mugs and muffin uh, gathering uh, from nine to 11 o'clock. It'll be here at Central Building and they're gonna provide coffee, hot chocolate, buns, muffins, and they're gonna have a special speaker uh, for this, and that will be Rachel Dixon. And so she'll be here and she's gonna to speak to them. So uh, there's a bunch of these flyers. I'm not gonna take time to read everything that's on the flyer, but uh, please keep that in mind. And uh, let's fill that, uh, that area over at the, the uh, reception building uh, so that they'll have a good number and I know that you all will appreciate it. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the privilege that we've had to be able to be here today to worship you. We thank you for the lesson that was given from Brother David to, to remind us of your, your power, your greatness, and, and your love, dear Lord. And we just pray that we will hold, 
Hold on to these things and remember them all the days of our lives. We pray for those that are sick. We pray that you will be with them and help them get better, dear Lord. Please give us our sins. In Christ's name, amen.